What's up guys? Thanks for checking out another episode of the TDI build in my 2001 Jeep Cherokee. Just to recap, I've swapped a Volkswagen TDI turbo diesel engine into my 2001 Jeep Cherokee. This time I'm going to talk to you about what I did for the coolant system as well as the intercooler and boost piping. So to be honest, the coolant system was one of the biggest question marks for me going into this. I just wasn't sure uh, mainly if I was going to be able to fit a large front mount intercooler in front of the radiator. I also had some questions about how I was going to route the coolant and boost piping. With this as my biggest concern, the first component that made sense for me to source was the front mount intercooler. To use the unit that I used, go on eBay and search for 24 and a half by 11 by two and a half FMIC. FMIC stands for front mount intercooler. This unit's around $100 and you can tell for sure that it's the right one. If it has those dimensions, it also has inlet outlet on the same side and the one outlet is pointed at a 45 degree angle. I knew I wanted the inlet and outlet to be on the same side, which would allow me to maximize the intercooler size as well as having both of those pipes go down through the large hole in that cross member on the front of the frame. Looking at the Volkswagen engine too, intake and exhaust are on the same side. So that means that your turbo outlet and intake inlet are on the same side of the engine. The first setup that I did used this same intercooler, but I did use the stock turbo. There were kind of two things I wanted to prove with the stock turbo. Mainly, would it fit? And second, would it be enough power to run the Jeep Cherokee? The main reason I chose to go away from that style, the VNT 15 housing style of uh, turbo is that I wanted to be able to fit an air conditioning compressor using a Passat B5 compressor and bracket. The turbo that I have now uses a VNT 20 compressor housing, which routes the compressor outlet directly towards the intercooler and keeps it up away from where I have the compressor mounted to the side of the engine block. Some of the most common questions that I get on this swap are actually related to the coolant system. And some of the general questions related to that that I get are, can you use the Cherokee stock radiator? I mean, is it gonna be too big, cooling the TDI too much? Is it gonna be too small, making it overheat? Are the inlet and outlet on the correct sides for this application? Uh, do you have to move it at all, forward or backward? And can you keep uh, an air conditioning condenser in there? All very good questions, exact same questions that I had when I was looking into this, and I'll talk through all of these issues and address all these questions with you as we go. So yes, I did use the stock 4.0 left-hand drive radiator. It has a inch and a half outlet on the driver's side down low and an inch and a quarter on the passenger side up high. This is a little bit of a challenge to find hoses to work with, but I'll show you what I use and they're working really well for me. The key to running the hoses the way that I did is with the flange on the back of the engine head. You have to flip that 180 degrees so that the inch and a quarter side of that was pointing to the passenger side of the engine. You'll see here I did test to make sure that that wasn't blocking the coolant flow or that the seal was gonna still be mating well with the head. I haven't had anything leaking with this running it the way that I did. With that done, I was able to then run a hard pipe up along the intake manifold and connect actually using the lower radiator hose from the donor car and put that as my upper radiator hose in the Jeep. I cut off each end of that a little bit, but that's an inch and a quarter hose. It has a good bend to it that routes it around the battery perfectly. The hard coolant pipe also does allow you to put a coolant uh, temperature sensor for your Jeep gauge into that pipe. I kind of expect this is going to change at some point. Do not recommend using this Mustang part. It's just senseless. A couple other things with the donor car before you get rid of it. Go ahead and save all of the radiator hoses and any of the smaller like heater hoses. The uh, Most of the hoses in the Volkswagen are about the 5 8 size, which is the smaller size from what the Jeep has. Uh, Jeep has 5 8 and 3 quarter. Also, most of the radiator hoses on the Jeep are inch and a quarter, same as the Volkswagen. Only bigger one is the lower radiator 
hose on the Jeep radiator. So save as much of that as you can. There's also some uh, couplers and things in that from the Volkswagen. Keep that as much of it as you can and uh, also keep all the Jeep stuff and uh, some of that may come in handy as well as you're kind of figuring out what your best routing is for some of those uh, hoses and tubes. Another kind of weird thing with the Volkswagen because it had a closed uh, pressurized coolant system you know, where the, uh, the bottle, the coolant overflow bottle is your pressure relief. The Jeep is not that way. I chose to use the Jeep system because it just looks a little bit cleaner and uh, there seems to be no problem running it the way that I did where there's that little steam fitting on the back of the Volkswagen head and I put a barb fitting also in that hard pipe so that that is the highest point in the system. So if I ever needed to bleed off air from the system, I could just disconnect that and that would be the highest point in my coolant system. Mine being automatic, it has a little bit of a different pipe for what the heater hoses and oil cooler feed off of. So I did cut that because there's an extra circuit on the cooling system on the automatics that goes through a heat exchanger on the transmission. For heater hoses, I'm using the stock XJ molded heater hose. This is a three quarter inch one that goes to the top of the uh, heater core there. And this is coming to a T, which I just picked up at the parts store. And this will connect to the coolant outlet on the back of the engine head. And then the other part of this T will go down to my oil cooler, which is below the oil filter down there. Uh, I will probably zip tie these two together down here. And this routes around nicely, if this would focus, routes around nicely down behind everything over to my T. The T joins in to the coolant flange. And then this part of the T is gonna come in front of the wire there. And this is the other hose that goes to the oil cooler. So it'll join up next to that one and ride that down to the oil cooler. I'll zip tie those together then as well. So the reason I use the stock Cherokee hose Peter hose is because it actually formed pretty nicely to that routing. If you were to do that with straight hose, it would require a bunch of these kind of things or it'd have to be pretty wide and sloppy to get out and around all this stuff and do what it needs to do there. It's being kept away from the manifold nicely this is connected to a hard pipe back here. So that kind of connection was always this close to the manifold. So we know these being that far away are gonna be plenty protected from heat, so. The coolant flange on the back there is that's a 5 8 inch, or sorry, that's a 3 quarter inch fitting there. And so this 3 quarter inch little tube here connects over to a 3 quarter inch T. Another three quarter inch hose running back off of that around to the heater core. My other connection there is what goes down to the oil cooler. That's a five eighths inch hose and I was able to comfortably enough stretch that over the T. So that's my kind of adapter from uh, five eighths to three quarters right there. So this is the bottom side of the oil cooler and just directly above that is the oil filter. This is between the transmission bell housing and the motor mount alternator up there in front of it. So these hoses point towards the flywheel, towards the back of the engine. And there's two hoses. One, I never even disconnected, the, the one that's above here, this, this one up here. Never even disconnected that one uh, because it's hard, it's connected to the uh, hard coolant tube that runs down the driver's side of the engine block. This one I had to find a hose for, and I ended up using, uh, I believe it was the 5 8 inch uh, hose from the XJ. Had a little bit of a curve to it, uh, but really 
there's not any particular reason you couldn't just use a straight piece of hose from the parts store. It's, uh, yeah, it's just 5 8 heater hose, and there's nothing, no bends in it that are so stinking tight that you couldn't, uh, couldn't make it work with just a straight piece. Here's a diagram explaining the routing. As far as moving the radiator, I did push it towards the engine about one inch. And the way I did it, I don't regret doing this this way because it did make it easy for me to mount the condenser. However, the, the real takeaway here is just that it's moved approximately one inch, which gave me the room to then tighten the condenser closer to the radiator and still fit my front mount intercooler by clearancing the grill just a little bit. One thing you might want to consider, instead of modifying the bottom of your radiator to modify where it mounts into the cross member. The benefit to modifying the cross member instead of the radiator is that you could then just quickly swap in a parts store radiator without having to modify anything additionally at that time. This is the passenger side, that's the driver's side, but this is the outside, this is the inside. So hopefully it's not too confusing. To move these little pins, I cut them off flush here and I used a little piece of angle, which I notched in a V for sitting around this kind of dimple here. And these are moved exactly one inch. So this pushes the radiator one inch closer towards the engine, giving you that much extra room for your, your intercooler. One thing here, uh, so I've moved the radiator forward as I showed you, but in doing that, you're, of course, bringing it closer to the firewall, closer to the engine. And we've got a close clearance here. It's touching. It's not keeping the radiator back at all, but we don't want things like that touching because that leads to failure. So I'm going to cut that. The other side actually here did not need to be cut at all. I did have to cut that little notch out of there. And that's also that the reason that's kind of a hole there is that that was the it was a tie-in spot for this fender bracket. So that tied in here. You can kind of see where I cut it. So that went and tied in through a bolt in that hole. As far as where the intercooler is placed here, uh, basically this weld to the end tank is kind of overlapping this seam of the radiator so that they kind of overlap and nest as well as possible. This needs to be as far to the driver's side as possible. So it's gonna take a little cutting of the header here. This is just fiberglass. Plenty of clearance down around the bottom and probably want to clear a little bit more on the top part here but this tab definitely has to go so I just want to take a look at what this is going to be like this back on Obviously still have three points connecting it and this headlight bezel does hold this corner on. So I think I can live without that. And then this, this really should have a little bit of trimming down to the back of it. Just kind of, I'll probably just use a grinder or like a burr, burr grinder and take just a little bit of this away just so it's not constantly rubbing the inner cooler there. 
The last couple tweaks to the header panel here. I've got one little corner cut off of there. I need to trim up this little thing so it doesn't poke out my fins. I'm gonna just cut this whole kind of step off of that. And up top here, a little bit more cutting to do <clears throat> up in here. I'm gonna pull this off one more time, make those adjustments. Give this one last close up inspection before closing things up. And we've got some gap there. All the way along here, there's plenty of gap. Down the bottom, we're totally good. This side is good. Right here, we're good. And it's even got some movement before it would hit anything. So I think that's good. We're all set. Now for the wiring harness, mine has fog lights. I'm wiring in rigid lights into that. The wiring harness here, I just added a little bit of tape to bring the marker light uh, wire over here a little bit more securely. And I also, uh, let's see, pulled the, there was a hold down clip for the headlight wire. Kind of want the headlight to be over here more. And I need this to be and I'm wedged down in here further so that all this wire loom is down in there. So I'm gonna zip tie. Grill is fitting pretty well. It's definitely tight right at this weld in the tank. Everything else though has plenty of clearance and I'm super happy with the fit. Took down a little bit of the, the screw mount that went into the tab I deleted. Uh, came down to kind of these cross middle pieces on both sides, top and bottom. And really probably took that down about, I don't know, three sixteen seven inch maybe all the way around. So, seems to be clean and clear now. Just my guinea pig grill. It's touching the header before it touches the tank. It does not touch the core at all. So that's really gonna be the fragile area. So, I'll duplicate what I did there onto my real grill and that should be well fitted. Well, I got some of the reducers in that I needed to be able to hook up the two inch piping to the two and a half inch inlet and outlet of the intercooler. So I've just got a straight reducer here, two inch to two and a half, and a 90 degree two to two and a half reducer here. I had to cut this one a little bit shorter. All these elbows are pretty long on the straight end, which is kind of nice. Uh, so still, uh, Plenty of curve here. It's not making this any kind of awkward flow, but uh, trimmed probably three quarters of an inch off of that. This is a 45 that's cut, comes down to a 90, which is again another trim to that piece.
here's what I have. This would be the intercooler end going to turbo. So, see this is a 45, cut a little bit short here. And then a two inch elbow. And another 45, cut very short on that end. And a two inch to two and a half inch reducer there. Right, so keeping in mind the way that this is all laid out, intake manifold here, turbo output down here. So this is airflow this direction out of the turbo. And it's gonna come through here into the intercooler. Goes loops through the intercooler and then goes back down through here. And then it has to come up to get into the intake. This should all make sense to you now. So this is your air intake and outlet from the turbo. So air flows through that tube, makes a 245s. So 45 silicone, 45 aluminum, 90 degree turn to come up and then a 45 into the intercooler does its loop through the intercooler and then 90 down 180 back up so this is the cross member through here 180 back up comes up here and then 90s back to the air intake these are the exact same coupler silicone and these are what connect to my intercooler, which is two and a half inches, and steps down to the two inch for all the aluminum piping that I ran. And the one that's closer to the Jeep here is a squirrely brand, I believe it is, something I bought off of eBay. Uh, this one's not the worst, not the worst of the cheap silicones, but uh, surprisingly, for it being heavier silicone and almost enough plies, it's uh, this stretched out and was leaking on me. Um, so I've gone and spent the ten dollars on this piece. I think this was like seven or eight dollars, maybe. Uh, where are they silicone pieces start to get more expensive? Uh, you know prohibitively so perhaps is in the uh, elbows those are the most expensive silicone pieces especially an elbow reducer those are like seven no they're like twenty dollars um, so you can kind of see what I'm talking about here between the plies it is tough because the one has brand new white threads in there <clears throat> for the polyester and this one they're uh, a little bit darker from being used but hopefully you can kind of appreciate the difference there and see how much squishier the cheap one is so I think the bigger problem here really is that the cheap one stretched it goes through a lot of temperature changes and while it's getting hot it's also getting expanded with pressure and as we know, uh, if you look at the pressure ratings for anything, uh, tubing related, they tend to give a, a few different ratings at different temperatures. So like PEX tubing, for example, it'll give you, you know, 300 PSI rating, uh, but it's at a low 
temperature. You know, somewhere uh, a little bit above what you might find as an ambient room temperature. If you were to increase that to like 150 degrees, the pressure rating goes sit down significantly. So, that's how sloppy that is. How easily that stretches. And even when you were to clamp down on that, it can still kind of leave you with some gap. No good. The name brand, if you will, silicone, uh, is already harder to put on here. Once you get it on, it still has a little bit of slop there, but you can see that once you were to clamp down on that, I really can't get nearly the amount of stretch out of that. The map sensor on these cars is normally located in the stock intercooler. I chose to mount mine into what's known as a race pipe or EGR delete pipe that comes off the front of the manifold. Because the race pipe is aluminum, I asked my buddy Seth to TIG weld a bung into it for me that I could mount the map sensor in. Denser is in place here. Uh, that's also moved back just a little bit. So normally these brackets hold the condenser away from the air conditioner uh, by, I don't know, maybe a half inch. Uh, I have it down to like a sixteenth of an inch. Just don't want them touching. But uh, this radiator is pretty much already uh, almost too efficient for this engine. So. Uh, this is fine. I'm not worried about blocking airflow. And then the, um, the intercooler is going to go in front of that. The bottom tabs that normally go underneath the, uh, sort of grommets that the radiator sits in. So that's this bracket just with a new hole drilled in it for that to move further back. I had to cut this off so that it doesn't touch the top piece there. This is what was cut off of the bottom. Normally that's on the opposite side of the condenser here, like this. And normally goes underneath to this grommet where that belongs. For it to be involved with that same grommet now would push this way too far forward because that grommet is still in the original location of the radiator and the radiators would move back that far. So I just kind of ground these down to where they sit in this. this is a cut down piece of angle iron. Just kind of sits right in that little groove. And it's nice and thick a mounting point there. So that's going to be my bottom mounting point. And then the top is just kind of going to be sandwiched in there. Um, not really worried about rubber mounting this thing. It did have some rubber mount to it to begin with. But really if it's... The radiator is rubber mounted and this is rubber mounted with it. This is the air conditioning bracket that I got off of a Passat 1.8T at the junkyard. And uh, what I'm finding here is there were three mounting bolts for this to the block. The Passat does use a secondary belt for the air conditioning compressor drive. It's driven off of a double crank pulley which you also need to get from the Passat. This setup uses an idler tensioner, so be sure to grab that. The tensioner is available as an aftermarket or replacement part as well. So this was mounted passenger side of the block and essentially like this. The bottom hole that they used on the 1.8T is below the block. It's kind of, kind of comes in just below this tab thing here. And the, so the main, the top hole is here, the back hole is here, and the other hole is blank here. It's not even drilled all the way through on this, so I'll drill that through, and then uh, that'll be my three holes. So back, top, and front. Turbo should be well above that, 
it's a little bit concerning how close that actually ends up to the control arm there. So that might be three link uh, excuse there. Go with a three link, cut that whole bracket off and that wouldn't be an issue anymore. But I'm gonna start by drilling that out. Get the bracket pretty much bolted on here. I got all three bolts in. Uh, this is that hole that we just drilled out. And you can see there's a little bit of a gap there. And the other ones are snug and they're sitting nicely as far as we can tell. But what I'm noticing is contact down here between the bracket and that little tab on the engine block. So that being cast iron and being part of the engine block, I'm gonna leave it alone and uh, clearance the bracket a little bit since I know I'm not gonna need that portion of the bracket for this, for, for being mounted on this engine. I'm gonna clearance just enough of the aluminum bracket to clear this tab on the block. So, you see that there's light all the way around it. Nothing's touching, everything's tight. So it's been clearanced enough. I'll pull it off and show you what I did. This is all I had to clearance from the bracket. Mostly it was just to the back side of this bottom hole, which we're not using. And a little bit of this kind of structure rib here. This was kind of incidental just from the size of the grinder wheel that I was using. If you were more careful, you could clear just this part and that's all you need to do. This tab off of the front uh, unibody frame here needs to be cut. So we'll have a cut here, all along here. I'm gonna leave that pinch weld. As for cooling fans, I do not have a mechanical fan, of course, as there would be no way to drive that off of the Volkswagen. I'm just using a single stock electric fan and this is triggered from the from a switch inside. I'd like to set it up with a thermostat switch. Uh, I'm using the stock fan relay in the XJ right now and just triggering it off of, on mine it says blue and white wire. And that just needs to be grounded through the switch for that to work. Uh, kicks this on using the factory relay, but the thermostatic control for it through the ECU on the Jeep didn't seem to have a low enough threshold to turn this on. So it was turning, it didn't want to turn on until I was uncomfortably hot with the engine uh, sitting at idle or cruising off-road. This fan has always kept things at operating temperature in every situation I've been in, whether it's a long steep hill, off-roading, or sitting in traffic on a hot day. This has also helped to keep the intake air temperatures, which are cooled by the intercooler and air passing through it, at about 12 degrees or less above ambient temperature, even in all the situations I just described. There's my three inch intake here. Cliff at UMP recommended that I reduce it down at the turbo uh, instead of at the airbox. So that makes perfect sense. The turbo is only inch and three quarter outside diameter, but why not feed it all the air that it can take? We've got a bunch of bends to make to get it there. So may as well leave them three inch. I've got the clearance for it here. So I need to cut this back shorter so that it aligns with my box outlet there. I need to shorten this up a little on the air box end. That's it for this time. Thanks so much for watching. Hopefully you got a little more inspiration on your build or got a little bit further along in your understanding of how you want to do your swap. Catch you next time.